Good morning. Would you please stand and worship with us this morning?
and welcome to Monticello Christian Church. Uh, we're glad you've all joined us here this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, um, we'd love to connect with you, and there are a couple ways that you can do that. Um, you can text the word new to the number that will be on the screen, or you can meet one of us out at the connection point sign in the coffee bar area after the service this morning. Um, bear with me because it's I get nervous when I'm talking up here, but I wanted to share a little bit about... Um, a recent leg of my faith journey. Um, many of you know that my dad was in the hospital for quite a while, and while he's back home now and doing really well, uh, there were some really scary moments um, at his bedside. Um, and looking back on that time now, I realize that even when the certainty of his life or the lives of, you know, whether it's mine or any, you know, those we hold dear, even when that was stripped away momentarily, that certainty that we think we have here in this world, I still had hope. And I didn't, I don't know if I thought about that at the time, but looking back now, I realized that that wasn't stripped away. And I can't imagine going through this life without that. Um, and that's what I'm praising God for today. Um, I just invite you to join me as we continue in worship.
God, we thank you that you can be our living hope, that we can put our trust and our faith in you. We just pray that as we um, hear your word this morning, that we can um, just be inspired by the hope that you bring to our lives. and um, Just respond and take these words with us as we um, live our daily lives. We just pray that you would uh, bless this time we have together today. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. You can have a seat. It was good to see you. It feels like forever since I have been here. Been away for a couple of weeks on vacation. Thank you for allowing me to have some time away uh, to sunny Florida. Good to be back here with you. Yes, we had a great time. Yes, I did get motion sickness on the boat, uh, but we had a good time anyway. Uh, but I am excited to be back here with you uh, during this season. We're starting a brand new series that's going to lead us all the way to Easter. This is my favorite time of the year to preach. I like this time of the year even better than I like preaching leading up to Christmas because there's just something about the Easter season as we get to talk about uh, what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, through His death and His resurrection. And there just seems to be this openness to what God wants to do in our lives and uh, just a, a willingness to uh, let Him take us further and to deepen our faith. And so I invite you on this journey with me as we begin this brand new series called First Person, Putting Jesus Where He Belongs in Our Lives. And as I, as I you know, mentioned first person, uh, maybe you're thinking pronouns, and I want to just caution you, maybe calm you. This is not a series about pronouns. This is more of a series about perspective. But at the same time, it would be good for us to have a little bit of an English lesson for those of us who have been out of school for a number of years. We think about pronouns. First person is, you know, I, me, we, us. Second person is you. Third person is he, she, they, it, them. So now that we all have this understanding, again, that's the, those are pros, pronouns, but we're really talking more about perspective. I want us to think about how easy it is, and, and with, with very little effort, effort in our life, how, how easy it is to keep ourselves in the place of first person, to think about life, to look at life, to do life totally from our perspective. That's, that's, just, that's kind of where we live. And it's, and it's very difficult to make the switch to where we put somebody else in that place to where they're in the driver's seat. Or we yield to their perspective. Or we yield to their desires, their wants, their wishes, and things like that. Uh, it, it's a challenge to allow someone else to have this first-person place in our life. And the, I think the greatest illustration from, from all of our perspectives, for those of us in the room who are or have been married or married again, is, is marriage, because marriage may have been the first time in your life where you have been challenged to let somebody else come in and let them call the shots for a while, to intentionally put somebody else in uh, the place of first person in their life so you're not just thinking about life and looking at life and doing life through your own perspective. So in marriage, you, you're, you're learning how, that's why it's so hard in the first year of marriage, you are learning how to yield to someone else's desires. And this is no small feat for a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of couples. In fact, a lot of people fail, a lot of marriages fail simply because uh, the one or both of the people in the marriage never stopped living for themselves. They never really learned how to yield to the other person or how to think about the other person or look at life through the perspective of the other person when really that's what marriage is all about. And that's what really makes marriage a beautiful thing, especially down the, you know, down the road several years later. Well, if you think about Christianity, it's much the same thing as we're talking about what it means to mature as a Christian, to grow in our faith. And the essence of that, the essence of that is yielding to Jesus. It's learning how to ensure that Jesus gets the spot of being first person in our life. And so we think, need to think about well, what, does that, what does that really look like to, to do life, to see life from Jesus' perspective. And that's maturing. It's yielding to Jesus. And it doesn't happen overnight. At least it didn't for me. And it doesn't for most Christians that I uh, know or been familiar with over the years. It takes a while. And the reason is, again, we've lived our life for a certain number of years, 
where we had control, where we were the ones making the decisions for ourselves, what we thought was in our best interest. And, you know, the one thing about children, they're kids and they're cute and naive and innocent and all that until they're not, but they're, they're very selfish. You know, early on, they're making decisions about themselves. I want this. I want that. And, you know, as you grow up, mature, you know, maturity-wise, you, you learn, hopefully, not everybody, not everybody matures, let's just be honest, but hopefully you mature in such a way that you can start looking at life through the perspective of other people. And Christian maturity is exactly that. But it takes time because we have that natural resistance in life that we don't want to make adjustments for others, that we want to continue to have that sense of, of control in our life. And so the first part of this series, and really the, the gist of the entire series, is really being honest with where we are in life. Are we in this first person place where we want to keep it there and we want to be the only perspective that matters in our life? Or are we willing to allow Jesus to come in and to make those changes and adjustments, to allow him to be in first person? And so we need to be honest about where we are and honest about where Jesus is in our life. So if you're thinking about this, and, and, and it's almost like the self-critique in, in a way, and so for those of you in the room who are a boss or a manager, maybe you've done this. Have you ever heard of a compliment sandwich? Uh, it's the, it's, there's a, the social psychologist that I like to read occasionally. His name is Adam Grant. He's, read, he's written some amazing books. But he came out with this article, article recently talking about a compliment sandwich. And you've probably been the victim of one. So here's how it goes. Uh, the boss comes in wanting to talk to an employee. And what they do is they have a hard truth. They have something that they need to talk about, critique. And so what they do is they come in and they, and they, layer, they layer that critique with a slice of praise on the top and a slice of praise on the bottom. And so they're complimenting first and then they're giving the critique and then they're complimenting again. We've either been the victim of it or we've done it in some ways. And that, you know, a lot of times that is, that is taught as like a best practice. I have done that. I, recently I've told our staff, don't expect me to do that anymore because it's not a good idea. There's, there's a better technique. But I mean, think about this. If this happens to you and, and you're the employee, the boss comes in and says, hey, um, you are doing great at this. I, I just really want to compliment you for a good job. What are you doing? You're bracing yourself because you know what's coming. You know there's a big but coming. Oh, but I've noticed this, okay? So it's one of the reasons why this doesn't work is because when they come in and they start this compliment sandwich, uh, it's, it's a little bit, just a little bit disingenuous, but you're bracing for the bad news, and so you're really not even going to pay much attention to the compliment because you're just waiting. The second reason it doesn't work is just by human nature, what humans pay attention to the most is what's said at the beginning, what's said at the end. And so we're not even really going to hear or pay much attention to the critique. We're more inclined, if, especially for those of us bosses that maybe want to go overboard on the compliment side. And we do this because we want to soften the hard truth. I mean, nobody likes like being the bearer of bad news and going in and having to, you have to talk with someone. You have to have a hard conversation with someone. You have to correct behavior, whatever it is. Nobody really enjoys doing that unless you're a total jerk. And so you try to soften the blow a little bit. So the compliment sandwich doesn't work. There's better techniques. But the point is, is this. We try to minimize the hard truth that we want to convey to someone else. Because we just don't like doing it. Soften the blow. Well, at the risk of totally offending everybody in the room, uh, what about the truth about us? Because there is some hard truth that we need to deal with this morning. And I'm going to share some hard truth with you. And I don't want you to be offended because it's going to be given in love. But I'm not even, I'm not going to do a compliment sandwich. I'm not going to say, oh, you are a great congregation. You've been supportive. You've been generous. You like to study your Bible. You're just a great bunch of people to hang out with. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm just going to give it to you straight. So here it is. And it's given with love. You are a sinner. There it is. In fact, you've been a sinner for a number of years. Sin is alive and well working in your body. And in your mind, in your heart. But the reality is, that's not the word. I mean, it's not, it's not terrible news because you're in good company. If you think about it, you've had these seasons of selfishness in your life, and some days are better than other days. But at the end of the day, 
we're all sinners. So you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. It's just the reality of the situation. But you're in good company because everybody that's ever lived except for one person is a sinner. And so whether we're talking about the Pope or Mother Teresa or the Apostle Paul or John the Baptist or Adam and Eve, that's kind of where it started, or Taylor Swift or Elvis or whoever it is, uh, it doesn't, your sweet grandmother, as sweet as she is, she was a sinner. And so we're all in this same boat. And here's the hard truth from Scripture about all of us, just so we're all on the same page. This comes from Romans chapter 3, verse 23. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Your translation might say we're, we're all sinners, and we all fall short of the, of the grace of God. And that's just the reality of every one of us. As we are a sinner, we have fallen short of this glorious standard, and that is the hard truth, the truth that we may not want to hear about all of us. But the good news is, as hard as this truth is, God has better truth that will take care of this bad truth. He has both truth and grace that will take care of the truth about us. And so for years and years before Jesus, God's people have been, had been reading about this promised Messiah. This Savior, Rescuer who was coming, who would be able to take care of our great sin problem. And there were prophecies for years and years pointing to this future time that a Messiah would one day come. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus is born uh, to this young couple in Nazareth. And, uh, you know, he, he, he grows up in a Jewish household. He's a very normal boy. Uh, he gets to read the Jewish text, which is promises about this Messiah. And he gets to go to the temple with his dad and, and you know, hear the, hear the other older gentlemen, you know, speak and expound on the scripture of that day and, and gets to hear the verse of the day. And he's, he's well versed in all of these, all of these, uh, old, even they didn't know it was the Old Testament, but all of these Old Testament scriptures about him, about the promised Messiah who would one day be coming. And this is something that they'd done for years, and they would read these scrolls, and it reminded them and encouraged them about the Messiah which who was going to come. But as they were reading them, it was they were reading them in third person. The Messiah, He is coming. He will be here. He will rescue us. He will cleanse us from all of our sins. He is, he is the one. And so He comes, and He grows up. And one day, He gets to go to the uh, this little synagogue there with, you know, maybe may with his dad, I don't know, maybe with his dad at that time. He gets to go, and he is the one who gets to read the text, the message that day. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. So if you want to turn there, go ahead. Jesus didn't open up and say, hey, we're going to look at Luke chapter 4 because Luke hadn't written it yet. So we're just going to look at the scripture that he read, which is actually Isaiah chapter 61. I want us to listen to this as Jesus would be saying it to the people who first heard him say it. I don't know if you've ever seen The Chosen or not, but there's a fantastic scene in season three where this, this is played out, and you really got to see it. But listen to Isaiah, Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll, <clears throat> excuse me, the scroll, and found the place where this was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So he opens up this text, and, and, and Luke says he found the place, which means this is no coincidental reading. He just didn't open up the scriptures and just put his finger down and, and say, I'm going to read this, this right here, okay? He might have even taken the scripture that was supposed to have been read that day and changed it because he went and he found the scripture that he wanted to read, which is a scripture about himself, which defines his ministry and mission. It describes what Jesus does as, as the Messiah. And so as people have been reading this for years and years, they've been reading it in third person all these years. But I don't know if you picked up on this or not. As Jesus is reading Isaiah chapter 61 for the first time, it's being read in first person. They probably didn't even realize it. I'm sure they didn't. And a part of this, it's almost like Jesus is saying, ready or not, here I am. But they don't get it yet. And the fact that they don't recognize Jesus comes from 
the fact that they probably were misunderstanding the promises about the Messiah because they were understanding them in the context of their situation. They were under Roman oppression. And so they assumed that the Messiah was going to come and to set them free from the oppression of, of the Romans at that time. And so they were, they were looking for more of a political leader. Now, that's easy to do. You think about our time today. You know, you think uh, about the president of Ukraine and how the world has just gotten behind him because he's a, he's a political leader and he's fighting for freedom. You know, and you think about the gentleman that died recently over in Russia, and I'm not going to get into all that, and that's not a political statement. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying how easy is it for us to want to get behind a political leader of some kind. And that is where the people were living at that point in time. They wanted to get behind this Messiah that was going to come and set them free from the Romans. That was the real truth. So stick a pin in that, okay? They totally didn't know that when Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he actually meant, no, really, guys, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, uh, uh, upon him. They didn't realize he was reading about himself from Isaiah chapter 61 because they'd probably heard it hundreds of times read in their, in their daily readings. And they had these different assumptions. And they didn't know that Jesus was talking in first person. When he says he came to bring good news to the poor, well, yeah, we know from other scriptures that God loves the poor and that God wants us to be there for the poor and to, to take care of them. But they didn't understand that what he was really talking about there really could have been talking about the, the sad situation that we are all poor in spirit and that we all need the Lord and that, that he's talking about for anyone who believes in the Messiah that we are going to receive the extravagance of the riches of heaven. And they probably thought that he was talking about setting the captives free. This was about being freed from Rome. They didn't really think that Jesus was talking about being freed from sin. When he talked about you know, restoring sight to the blind, we obviously know that Jesus went and he healed people who were physically blind. And that's still always going to be a part of the package. But they may not have realized that what he was talking about was really opening people's eyes so that they could see their need for a Savior and they could see the kingdom of God that was now present right there with them. So they weren't looking at this right going into it. But if anyone missed Jesus' personal claim and reading this in the first person, if anyone missed it, they would have gotten it from what he said next. Look at verses 20 and 21. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All of the eyes of the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard was fulfilled this very day. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that room at that moment. I think this would have been one of the greatest moments in all of history. He just mic dropped a bombshell statement in the middle of this Jewish gathering, something that they'd never heard before. These scriptures about the Messiah are fulfilled right here, right now, in your hearing. How lucky are you? Now, what's interesting about this, from my perspective, is that they were not alarmed that Jesus said this. In fact, look at verse 22. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by his gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be? They asked, isn't this Joseph's son? So my take on that is this, and, and you can prove me wrong, we can argue about it later, but my take on that is this. I think there are some people that were willing to go along with this. I mean, after all, they've been reading about it for years. It's like, well, why not now? Why can't it be? You know, this, it, there, there, there were some people in the room that were like, okay, okay, I can, I can buy this, I can get into this. And some people are probably thinking, well, maybe they heard it wrong, you know, maybe, there, maybe there's some people that are like, well, this is, Joseph, this is Joseph and Mary's boy, and he's always been an overachiever. Maybe he's just a little bit eager, you know, this morning, and he's reading this text, and who knows, but nobody was like shocked at that moment when he said this. Uh, they were being gracious to him and respectful until he presses it just a little bit further. Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote, this, uh, quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. 
Yet Elijah was not sent to any one of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. And, in, and many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one healed was Naaman the Syrian. So everybody's being gracious at first at his gracious words. And now, now it almost sounds like Jesus is picking a fight. Because now it's like he turns the table on him. Now he's like, okay, uh, I'm going to tell you some hard truth about you. You're going to reject me as the Messiah. Once they find out that he is going to the Gentiles, he is going beyond Jerusalem, which we see this in all of the book of Acts. We, even, we see this in the ministry of Jesus. Once they, once they find out that he is going beyond Israel, they're going to reject him. And he calls them on it right there. And he said, you know what? He said, you're no different than the prophets of old. Who, re- who, uh, who, were, who were rejected by Israel because they went outside and they ministered to people who were outside of Israel. So you're just like them. In fact, he tells me, he's like, when you quote me this proper physician, you know, go heal yourself, what they're saying to him was, no, we want you to prove who you are by doing miracles right here in our presence. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to be going off to Capernaum. You don't need to be going off to the Gentile areas and going beyond Israel and doing stuff out there. No, you just come and do this in your hometown and prove you are right here. Here's what's going on. They're all about the Messiah, but they're no not about his idea of the Messiah. Jesus didn't fit their mold. He didn't fit into their categories. They didn't like his perspective of what the Messiah would do and say and where he would go and who he would minister to. They wanted the Messiah on their terms. They wanted the faith that they could control. They wanted to keep God in a box. And so when Jesus comes and says, nope, I'm going out of the box, I'm leaving Jerusalem, they're like, we ain't having it. This is not the Messiah that we were looking for. And so this is, you know, so the truth hurts. And he's like, you're going to reject me, just like my people have rejected all the prophets before. You're going you're to harden your hearts. But this scripture that Jesus read about himself, he's saying, no, this is who the Messiah is. He is the fulfillment. He is the Son of God. He is the rescuer. He is the Savior. He came to bring good news. He came to set captive free. He came to restore sight to the blind. He he came to offer the gift of God's grace to anyone who would believe. And he's saying, I am the Messiah. He just wasn't their kind of Messiah. The truth about them might be might be the same hard truth that many of us deal with today, that we may not be ready to put Jesus in the place of first person because of the things that Jesus did and said, because of the claim that he makes on our life, because of the acts of obedience that he asks us to do. We are not ready to give Jesus that place of prominence. We are not ready to look at life through his perspective because we're all about faith and we're all about religion. We're all about coming to church. We just want it on our terms. We want it our way. So my question today is, was we begin this series about what it looks like to put Jesus where he belongs in our life. Are you ready? Are we ready to put him in the place of first person? Or are we ready to deal with some hard truth? See, we like truth as long as it's the truth that we like. Isn't that the truth? That's why we like the compliment sandwich. Because we can swallow the hard truth as long as it's surrounded by the compliments about how good we are and how good we, we've done in life. But this is some hard truth that we need to deal with. There's a statement called, uh, that, that says familiarity breeds contempt. And, and you think about it like this. How hard is it, is it to accept life-altering advice from someone who's close to you? We're more apt to want to receive it and take it from physician, a counselor, a consultant that we paid thousands of dollars to because we expect it from those kinds of people, not taking anything away from people who are in that industry. We need those people. But how hard is it really to take good advice, life-changing advice for somebody with whom we are more familiar with in life? It's difficult because we are familiar with them. We know them. It's like, well, yeah, but they're too close. And I think it's part of what's going on here. This is Jesus. This is Mary and Joseph's kid. He's a hometown boy. He's a Jewish kid just like any other Jewish kid. He's too familiar. He's too close to be the son 
of God. And it was, it was part of it was this kind of an attitude that kept them from embracing who Jesus was. And so when he told them the truth, he's like, he's like I'm going to go to the Gentiles just like Elijah and Elisha went to the Gentiles and I'm going to minister to them. It was what they needed to hear. And maybe we need to hear too so that we don't make the same mistake and not being ready to accept Jesus on his terms and to adopt his perspective in our life. And as we think about following Jesus today, sometimes it's not easy because of some of the things that he did and said that we just really weren't in the Bible. When Jesus tells us to love other people, we're all about love. The world would be just a better place with a lot more love until you're asked to go love the person that you don't like. And we just talked about this. We spent, you know, ten, to spent two weeks in Jonah, which is Jonah's all about the very fact that God loves your greatest enemy. And that's a hard truth to swallow. And Jesus has called us to love and pray for our enemies. Jesus has called us to forgive and offer mercy to those people who may have hurt us in life. And it doesn't mean that you need to, to be best buddies anymore. But it does mean that you need to get to a place where you can not wish them ill will and you can, you can free them so that you can be free as well. And Jesus has talk, you know, talked to us about, you know, about the, the, the pride that, that might be in our hearts. And, and he convicts us and we don't like it because the truth about us hurts. It's not the truth that we want to hear. And if we miss Jesus, it's not because we missed the chance of being able to accept him or, or be able to believe in him. We've all had that opportunity. The reason that we miss Jesus sometimes is more likely that we weren't interested in how his life would come in and change ours. We like the truth about Jesus. That we may not like the we, we like the grace about Jesus. We may just li not like the truth about Jesus, because sometimes that truth is not so easy to accept. I love what Augustine says: They love truth when it enlightens them, but hate truth when it accuses them. See, we can like someone. And we can admire someone from a distance. I like all kinds of people. There's all kinds of people I admire. But I'm not going to follow them. Their life is not going to change my life, my way of thinking. And I think some of us can get confused from time to time because we think that it's all about how much we like and admire. Jesus is a good person. He's just all right with me. How much we can admire Jesus from a distance. But Jesus is not looking for our admiration. He's looking for our allegiance. We would fully submit to him and to his perspective in our life. So does our faith in Christianity reflect that he's in first person, that he's Lord, that he's Messiah, and as well as being Savior? Or do we occupy first person in our life? Is Jesus the star of the show? Is he the star of our story? Or does he just get typecast as the best supporting actor in our story? Sometimes the truth hurts. Are we willing to see things from his perspective? Because if we're all honest, there's at least one area. There's at least one area, one issue, one sin, one problem that we have, one experience in, that we've had in life in the past, may have been a bad church experience, a bad relationship experience, whatever. There's one area in life that might be keeping us from placing Jesus where he belongs in our life. So what does that, what does that place, putting him in first person, what does that mean? It means that we're willing to see things from his perspective. It means that we're willing to take Jesus at his word. It means that we are, are willing to trust him when life looks bleak or we have recently received bad news or the money is running tight, whatever it is. It means that we will trust and follow him irregardless of those circumstances. It means that we are willing to let him change our life. Because if we believe the truth that Jesus came to save us, we must be willing to accept the truth that he also came to change us. So we have to accept the truth with the grace. You can't just like him. Truth and grace, it's a package deal. We have to let him change us to remake us or we will end up remaking him in our image, which is what the people who were listening to Jesus on that on that. On that day in the sin, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted a Jesus that fit their categories, that fit their perspective. 
And see, the, the, the reality is, Jesus will always mess with our assumptions. He's always going to mess with, our, with us and our assumptions until he has us, until we allow him to change us. And he did that with his first followers. He did that with the disciples until they got him. And they got him. And the reason that we know they finally understood him, and it was not until after his resurrection they fully understood him, but the reason that we know that they finally understood him was because we are here and that we have this opportunity to have accurate representation of who Jesus was. And we also understand that from the convincing way that they lived their lives and the fact that many of them died because of what they believed who Jesus was, what they believed about him. They lived in such a way that others could see that Jesus was in first place in their life. And see, that's the, that's the goal, that we can do that. We can get to a point where we can say this, He has replaced me. If we can get to that point in our life, that is profound, that is life-changing, and that will change the people around you. He has replaced me. We love the grace, but we can't have the grace without the truth. Jesus came to bring us good news. Jesus came because we're all poor and we can have the riches of heaven. Jesus came to set us free from the bond of sin. Jesus came to help us see the truth about him. Jesus came to give us the, the grace and favor of God. But sometimes we have, to, we have to come to terms and come to grips with the truth about us first. And if today, if the truth hurts, then the truth is doing what it was meant to do. If the truth hurts, it means that you are actually in a good place because you're at that point that like when you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you some kind of news about your health condition and it hurts, you don't like the diagnosis and you may not even like the treatment. The treatment may hurt worse than that, but you know that you got to do it because it's all good for you. So if you're here today and some of what I've been saying is hurting you, the truth, the truth is doing its job because the truth is going to lead you to a place where God is going to do something in your heart. Something is going on. Something that's beyond what we just let people see. Because sometimes we just want people just to see the best. And we can be honest about wanting to hear only the truth we want to hear. We can be honest about wanting to only have a religion that has allowed us to be comfortable in a convenient religion. But to understand that when Jesus comes in and we allow him to have first person, he's going to convict us. And that conviction often hurts. But here is the good news. Jesus will reveal the truth about us so that we can discover that he can bring healing to our life. And that's my prayer in this series. Is that the truth about us will help us discover the healing that comes from Him. The truth that will hurt us discovers will help us discover the healing that comes from Jesus. And so I, we get to participate, every week we get to participate in, in I really feel, as a time of healing. Because we've all come from our, our worlds, our, our last week, whatever last week was for you. For me, it was jumping back into the working world. For many of you, you were living in that world anyway. And maybe you had some moments where you're not real proud of it. Maybe you had some moments where you know that Jesus wasn't in first person. You were in first person. It was all about you. And there's some things that you did or said that you're not proud of. We get to come back in this place and understand that we are invited around his table to recognize what he did for us as our Lord and Savior, that he died for us to deal with the hard truth of the sin that, re that resides in our heart to cleanse us, to give us another opportunity. But ultimately, through the cross, through His blood, and through His resurrection, to find that healing that will bring us reconciliation with God and allow us to live this renewed life that He wants us to experience. And that's healing. That's, that's more healing that you're going to get from your physician, your counselor, your consultant, your therapist, this is deep, eternal, cleansing, forgiving, healing. And every one of us has an opportunity to experience this. All we have to do is believe. 
and who Jesus said he was as the Messiah who came to set us free. So here in just a few minutes, we're going to be able to share in this time of communion. And if you've not had a chance to get your personal communion cup, they're back there on the table. You've got time to do that now. But as we share this together, just a reminder that when it's right for you, you can go ahead and take the bread, which represents his broken body, willingly offered for us. And then we'll share the cup together. Let me pray for us. Father, we have to admit that so many times and on a daily basis, and oftentimes more frequently than we want to admit, that there is this ugly truth about us. The sin that resides in our heart, the sin that causes us to fall short of your glorious standard, the sin that severed the relationship between you and us is ever-present. But we are so thankful that today, at this moment, we get to recognize that one act in history that removes the barrier of sin between you and us, that allows us to find that healing, reconciliation, and to recognize that it was only through the shed blood of your Son that makes this possible. And because of that, we pray, and we pray that this moment can be this motivation that as we go out from this, this, this moment, that you will be given the place that only you deserve in our life. And that you will replace us. That your perspective will be greater than ours. And that the way that we live will be the way that you would have us to live as we put you in first person. We thank you for the bread. We thank you for the juice, which reminds us of your body and your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. take this juice together remembering that he's in first place because he put us in first place on the cross one of the ways we have regularly to make sure that Jesus does occupy the place where he belongs in our life is through the experience of giving and being generous toward his cause and uh, you know just being honest you, you churches today are facing the same economy crunch that uh, every household is facing. And so just, again, a moment of honesty and clarity uh, for our church family, that it would be a misconception for anyone to think that since uh, we were able to celebrate the beginning of December that we paid off uh, a very large amount of debt with God's help and your generosity, that uh, we have a big surplus right now. That's that's not the case. And so uh, we really appreciate and are thankful for your continued generosity as we move forward because we want to be a blessing to our community uh, as we figure out more ways to connect with people and reach Pyatt and even beyond and support our missionaries. And so uh, if you came today and you're prepared to be generous, uh, there are all of the usual ways are out there to do that on the back table through our website. One of the easiest places, honestly, is through our app, which is, has had kind of a redesign here lately. So you can go on the app and you can look around and have fun this afternoon. There's different ways. There's a there's an online connect card in the app. There's a way that you can actually take sermon notes in the app. Uh, there's a way that you can watch the sermon later, either audio uh, or video. Uh, there are ways to give, and there are ways for you to sign up and serve in different places. And so it's kind of a one-stop shop that you can use. Uh, but again, uh, if if you're like us, we just we we write a check. Uh, we're still check writers, um, and so you. You, you can do that too in the back. However you want to do that is the right way to do that for you. Let me pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to keep you where you belong in first place. And a lot, a lot of times, uh, it starts with our finances. Uh, for a lot of us, that's where it gets real. And so we pray you would be glorified 
and blessed through our generosity today. Uh, we recognize that it's only by your grace that we can give. And uh, we do that to glorify and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship together this morning? Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your breath. And I sing my own song. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocence. The shackles I wear, I bought on my own. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost and nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. And Lord, I confess. That I've been the prodigal Made for your house But walked my own road And then Jesus came And tore down my prison walls Death came to life Oh 
God, we thank you that we can always come to you with anything. We can just trust in you. We just pray that we can trust you enough to put you first in our lives, that we can uh, just ignore all these things of the world, and that we can uh, just run to you and know that you'll accept us with open arms. We just thank you so much for loving us and for caring for us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. May go in peace.